Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. I am absolutely delighted and honored to introduce back to the Ed Morrissey Show uh, one of my one of my favorite figures in politics, media commentary, uh, Bernie Goldberg, who is the author of the seminal book Bias, uh, which is still available, by the way. So go out and buy it if you haven't done it. He is now the proprietor of a, a very successful sub a Substack, uh, BernardGoldberg.substack.com. And he's just launching, by the way, a, a new podcast at, uh, at this uh, Substack, and it's called The No BS Zone. Uh, Bernie, so good to talk to you again. You know, after that introduction, I'm going to say thanks for having me. I got to go. <laughs> it can't get any better than that. <laughs> Well, we're going to make you stick around for a little. You, 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 now that now that see, I paid up front, and now you now you got to give me a few minutes uh, after after Fair that. Fair <laughs> By so, the way, you you say a podcast. I, I am so untechy. L let me make clear what I do, and then you tell me what how how we define it in twenty first century terms. I write a column. I do an audio report. I answer questions. And I actually answer them from people who write in and send in questions. And we just started this week a video 15-minute interview between the webmaster and me. I don't know if it's a podcast or what it is. It, I, I'm a journalist. And I write about and I talk about politics, the media, and a lot about the American culture and how it's changing, and in my view, not for the better. Right. Uh, but can I tell you, Ed, what I don't do? Because this is very important. I don't want to waste anybody's time on coming to my website if this is a problem for you. Cable news panders to the audience. Cable news tells the viewer precisely what the viewer wants to hear. The, the, the business model is simple. Get them angry, make them want to come back for more, but never surprise them with your opinions, never make them think, never disagree with what their opinions are. Sometimes the people who come to my website, I think more than sometimes will agree with me. Sometimes they won't, but I will never pander to the audience. I will never hold my finger up to the wind and say, I got to tell the people what they already believe. Otherwise, they won't like me. If you want that, go to cable news. Right. Because I have too much respect for the people who come to me to pander to them. Anyway, that's my spiel. And I am all yours. Well, and, and Bernie, Main, I think that that just makes you a person of integrity, right? A, a reporter and a... And a and a host, a columnist, an author uh, of integrity. And I think that your entire career has demonstrated that. And I mean, this is, you've been in, you, you've been on, on television in a number of different ways. I mean, you've been a, uh, on, you know, on the beat reporter, you've been um, show host or show co-host. I mean, so you know the ins and outs of this. And I think that, you know, your career, and not just you, I mean, I, I don't want to sell everybody short here. There's a number of people whose careers really speak for their integrity. Even if I disagree with them, even if I think they get things wrong from time to time, I, there's still people of integrity and there's still, or at least trying to be people of integrity. We're all, you know, we all have, you know, we all fall short from time to time. But, um, but I agree with you in the main um, on, you know, on cable media. And I would say maybe even, Maybe even more so, maybe it's that that may be more broadly applied to media in general, because most of the stuff that we see is really being micro targeted exactly. in, in a sense to to the people who you know singing to the choir. You're basically singing to the choir. Uh, it, it, is, it is more than cable. You're right. The New York Times, the the Bible, the Bible of, you know, when The New York Times puts something on page one, that gives permission to to NBC, CBS, and ABC, and everybody else, oh, now we can go with the story. And more and more, because they're subscription-based, they're not offending their audience either. <laughs> they make sure that, that their opinion pieces coincide with the, the views that are being brought to the, to the New York Times. Right. So you're right, it, it, you're right, Ed. It's, it's not only cable. They, they just annoy me more than most, but 
<laughs> but, but it's not only cable. I think cable is more designed for it, though, right? I mean, I, th I think what, we're, what you're seeing on in broader media is the evolution of these uh, journalistic institutions, um, which always had biases. I mean, this is something you cover in in, in your book, Bias. Um, uh, always had biases, but have really become drivers of echo chambers over over the years. I think exactly. cable media has just always been structured that way. It's always it's always been structured around that, and um, with, with a few exceptions. It's really about branding. It's really about it's really about um, targeting specific audiences and just feeding them what they want to hear. People say that about Fox News, but it's also tr equally true of MSNBC. It's it's equally true of CNN. Uh, and uh, and when you have, I, I don't know if you saw this exchange with Brian Stelter and a media critic. Um, Brian Stelter was really happy to get this guy on to talk about Fox News, but when he started talking about CNN, all of a sudden Brian Stelter was a little unhappy. Uh, by the way, I did see it. And that freshman who asked the question, and I, I can't tick off as well as he did. He, you know, his point was, yeah, you talk about Fox News, but let's talk about this information. And then he, he just ticked off one thing after another after another that was indisputable that CNN and, and a lot of the, the so-called mainstream media got wrong. And Brian Stelter, who who is a media analyst, you think might say, you make a good point and let's talk about it. But instead, he didn't want to talk about it at all. And that kid deserves a medal. He's, he's a, when I was a freshman in college, I was still spitting on myself. I mean, you know, I, I was a dummy and this kid nailed it. I, I, I wish I could remember all the things the whole list of things he he outlined for Stelter, uh, but he he nailed it. And disinformation. If you're going to point fingers at Fox, and that's fine with me, then CNN doesn't get off the hook. They, then don't let them off the hook. Right, right, exactly. Uh, and I don't. And, and in a sense, Ed. In a sense, CNN is worse. I'll tell you why. Fox opinion shows I could do without. I could do without CNN opinion shows and I could do without MSNBC opinion shows. Not because they, their opinions, not because one is liberal and one is conservative, that's fine with me, but because I don't think they're honest opinions. I, I think they're designed in that, in that silo of opinion whereby if you're Fox, you don't criticize Donald Trump. If you're CNN, you don't do anything but criticize Donald Trump. So, it isn't that their their opinions. It's it's that I can't trust their opinions. Right. You know what I mean? I can't trust their opinions. But here's why CNN arguably is worse. They pretend to be a news operation. Fox knows what it is and doesn't hide the fact of what it is. I think their hard news reporters are very good, by the way. Right. Uh, very good. Uh, but CNN pretends that they're news all the time. They're not. And that's why, in, in, in a sense, in, a, in a, an important sense to me anyway, they're worse than Fox. MSNBC is in a class all by itself. We, you know, there's, right. I, there's, I would argue that they're, that they're probably at the same level as Fox. They, they I mean, I, I sat on a, this is years ago, I sat on a, a panel with, um, oh, I can't remember his name, Phil something. He was the president of MSNBC. I don't think he's there any longer. Um, Phil, Phil Griffin. Yeah, Phil Griffin, right. And... Uh, this actually was in Jerusalem of all places, right? It was at the uh, it was at the presidential conferences that they used to have. So I was there with him and and uh, the editor in chief of Haaretz, and we were talking about media and, and branding. and And he explicitly said, "No, we are, we want to we want to brand ourselves as the progressive media outlet, where you go for progressive, you know, the progressive takes on news and stuff like that." And I, you know, I, I I respect that because it's honest. Um, it's honest, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So. CNN is less than, I, I haven't heard CNN say, we're the place you go if you want the liberal take on, on news. Nope. They'll never admit it. They'll right. never admit it. So yeah, I, I completely hear you on that. And um, But then that's the reason why I think you're starting to see a lot more interest in Substack and, and, and outfits like Substack, right? Where, where it's uh, subscription driven to a large extent. Um, I've been a subscriber to your feed ever since I think it started, um, and I enjoy reading it. I enjoy reading it every single day. I go through it and go uh, almost every single day, 
and um, which is one of the reasons why I saw that um, you've got this new um, series new. that's going to be the new, the new the no BS on, which I would call a podcast, just because it's there's all sorts of different ways that you can do that. It's just it's just shorthand for it. Um, but I mean, that gives you it certainly it, it doesn't give you the same level of security as getting <laughs> as getting a check from from you know a, a, a corporate level of um, of employment. But it does give you a lot more freedom. It gives you a lot more um, opening to find your own audience and to do what you just said at the beginning of uh, the beginning of this conversation, which is to say, I'm going to tell you the way I see things. If you, uh, I'm not going to pander to you. You don't need to because you're I, doing your own I, thing. But I'm not saying it. And you're not suggesting that I'm saying, I know that. I'm not saying I'm always right. These right, are my, yeah. they're my honest opinions. Now, if, if like my honest opinion is that the Democrats are gonna take a, a shellacking in November, okay? But, but I'm aware that this is April and a lot can happen between April and November. But but I, I've, I've just written a piece that'll be up soon. Uh, I think it may have been, it just went up today actually uh, about how this time around, it's not only the economy stupid. This time around, it's also the culture. And there are many things happening in the culture, whether it's children, five-year-old children being taught about uh, gender equity and sex orientation and all that, uh, whether it's about what has happened to this country because of uncontrollable immigration, whether it's parents being upset that their kids are being taught that they're oppressors or the oppressed simply because of the color of their skin, uh, whether it's crime and, and w while the president talks about guns and he's obsessed with guns, he doesn't talk about democratic progressive district attorneys that just let people out. Uh, these are the things I'm interested in, but I'm not saying I, I have 100%, you know, I have wisdom locked up maybe I got something wrong right. and people can, can respond and give me their opinions, but they're my honest opinions based on, as you suggested earlier, based on many, many, I don't want to do too many many's here years as a working journalist. Right. In other words, in other words, I didn't come to this as somebody who said, you know, I got opinions. I got opinions. I could, I, well, if he can give an opinion, why can't I give an opinion? I was covering hard news for a long time. And I learned in hard news, you give two sides or more than two sides. And an opinion, I may come down more often than not on the conservative side. I, I, I will readily cop to that. But I think about the other side before I come to my conclusion. Yeah. And that's important. And I'm speaking to a guy, you're speaking to a guy, I should say, Bernie, who did come to the business that way. I had opinions, I knew that I could write. And I thought, why am I, why don't I try dipping into this market and see what I could do? And, and it, and it worked. Yeah, uh, I'm but, not, I'm not saying my way was the only way. No, 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 I, no, I, I totally all, get that. All I'm saying is that when you cover hard news for, you know, my first assignment was covering the Lincoln administration. You know, I, I was, I, Abe and I hit it off. I mean, we were, you know. How, how was the play up to the ad lib? I just want to know, up to that ad lib from uh, John Wilkes Booth, how was the play going, uh, My American Cousin? Well, I, I said I said to Mrs. Lincoln, and funny you should ask, I said, besides that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the show? Uh, but, but my point is that this is one way to go. If you cover hard news, you, right. you start to think in a certain way. I'm, well, I'm not. Let, let me tell you who I'm not. I'm not Sean Hannity. Right. I'm not. Right. I'm not Tucker Carlson. You know. I I I give both sides in my head. I give both sides a fair shake, and then I come to an opinion, which again, more often than not, is a conservative opinion. You know, I, I think this is a really great point, and it's another reason why I think that there's really distinctions between different types of journalists and different types of opinionators for for a, a, a lack of a better word i mean obviously i'm i'm coming out of more of a pure opinion thing but i've been a news junkie since i was a kid so i mean i've been consuming this uh, a lot and i also have a sense of my own you know fallibility so like you 
you know, for different reasons, I came to it differently, but I always try to anticipate what the, what the counter argument is and try to yeah. give it some weight exactly. so that I, so I can make a better argument, right? Just so that I'm just not just ranting. Um, and, um, you know, and again, my, that's precisely my point. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the, one of the big elements in that, Bernie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is a sense of detachment, right? Which is to not marry yourself to a particular figure or a particular, um, you know, one particular uh, tribe, if you will, so that you can be more honest and be a little bit more detached and have a little bit better vision as to what reality actually is. And I think as a hard, no, as a hard journalism, as somebody with that much experience in hard journalism knows that, or at least they used to. Um, maybe not so much today, but certainly, you know, in the era that, that you were doing that, you you realize that. And one of the things that I always tell people is if you want to know how to approach politics as a, as, as a commentator, um, make sure you have Psalm 146 verse three <laughs> firmly planted in your head because it's great advice. Put not your trust in princes. <laughs> even if you're, right. even if you're not a believer, that's really good advice. And, um, and I think too many people now, including some folks that you've mentioned and some folks that you've mentioned by extension really, put their trust in in princes, put their trust in in tribes, and it shows. And it really uh, creates a, uh, a a lot poorer quality of public discourse as a result. You're absolutely right. Let me let me pick up on that. Even opinion has to be fair, right? Even we know that hard news has to be fair. But even opinion has to be fair. So if you're going to criticize let's do real names. If you're going to criticize Donald Trump for doing something, and then Joe Biden does the same thing, and you make believe it didn't happen, that's not honest. And if you're going to criticize Joe Biden for doing something, but you're not going to criticize Donald Trump for doing the same thing, or something close to the same thing, that's not honest. And that's where people have hooked up with princes and princesses, instead of with philosophy with principles uh, and and that's that's why I'm not a fan of opinion journalism today because as I say even opinion journalism has to be honest and I don't think it's honest when you pretend that this guy is bad all the time and your guy is good all the time and when your guy does the same thing that the other guy did you you just ignore it and it, 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 real life example, CNN, and I and I hinted at this earlier. CNN cannot get enough of bashing Donald Trump. There's a reason for this, and Fox can't get enough of making believe Donald Trump isn't a bad guy at all. And that's because, and this gets back to what we were talking about earlier. That's because cable news isn't a journalism model. It's right. A business, it's a business model, and it's a it's a brilliant business model give the customer what he wants or what she wants, never offend the customer. Well, that, that may be good for business. Actually, it's not good for business because people are fleeing even cable news in, in you know, record numbers. I, I put out a tweet recently and I said, I'm confused. If almost nobody is watching CNN right now, why do they want to pay to see more of it? <laughs> You weren't confused. You were. You weren't confused. CNN out. was confused. I couldn't. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I couldn't figure that out. And so even this pandering, even pandering doesn't work. CNN to be successful needs Donald Trump out there every day, doing something outrageous. And Fox needs Joe Biden, not being able to finish a sentence. Yeah. This is what I this is what I don't like about it. Yep. You, I don't. I'm not a fan of Joe Biden, but I'm not a fan of Donald Trump either. Uh, and, we're in the same spot. <laughs> you yeah, and I are in the same spot. And 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 while I'm like a lot of other people who say it's not Donald Trump's policy so much as Donald Trump himself. You know why I'm. A, you know why I don't like Donald Trump. And here's where I risk losing a part of your audience. But bear with me. I, because my, my my complaint with Donald Trump, besides the fact that he's 
dishonest and, and an egomaniac and uh, vindictive to a point that that's not good. You know, my problem with Donald Trump is all the harm he's done to the Republican Party. Yeah. Does anybody think, does anybody out there think that people voted for Joe Biden because they said, oh, he's a statesman. He's he's a brilliant, charismatic leader who has great ideas. No, 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 no. They voted for Joe Biden because he wasn't Donald Trump. So everything conservatives complain about every day about what Joe Biden is doing, whether it's the Supreme Court nominee who's going to be a, a, a justice in a few months, or whether it's his progressive agenda. Every time they complain, I wish they would just consider who 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 can you thank for that? Yep. Of Donald Trump. Because if Donald Trump wasn't so toxic, if he didn't offend a crucial block of the audience, and you've written about this, you know the crucial block are those independents in swing states. Yep. He didn't, if he didn't lose them in 2020, after he won them over in 2016, he lost them and he enabled Joe Biden to become president of the United States and do all the things conservatives don't like. Yep. That's my problem with Donald Trump. I... We don't disagree at all. <laughs> we don't disagree at all. And you've said it. You've said it very well. Um, I, I, I never trusted Donald Trump. Uh, I liked the policies, at, but I, I could see in that final year that he just didn't know how to scale down the chaos in, in the midst of a, a, of a, of a crisis. And uh, he threw away whatever whatever little trust he had. He threw it. He threw it away in, that, in, in all that chaos and. 2020 during COVID-19 when he should have been projecting calm leadership. Exactly. Um, you know, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Nobody cared about the mean tweets. Nobody really, nobody cared about the mean tweets. It was, it was all the rest of the craziness while people were freaking out that, that, un, that rattled them. And that's the reason why we got Joe Biden. So I'm, I'm completely with you on that. Not, now that's something that I think that you talk about, right. With John Daly on your premiere of the no BS zone, right? Yes. Yes, that was that was my point. Uh, when when I used to talk about Donald, by the way, I don't bring up Donald Trump. When I was on Fox, even after O'Reilly, uh, I'd be asked about Donald Trump, and I'd give him an honest opinion. And a lot of people watching would would light up social media and light me up because of, of what I said. And I said to Daly, who's the webmaster and a very bright guy, I said, John. Whenever I mention the name Donald Trump, there's a lot of reaction. So if we're going to try something new to see if it works, this video thing, let's talk about Donald Trump. And again, my point wasn't to bash Donald Trump. My point was to say, if you like conservative values, if you think Judge Jackson, who will soon be Justice Jackson, was not your choice of a, a nominee, well, it didn't just happen. The Senate was able to vote for, for Judge Jackson and because Donald Trump went to Georgia and, and instead of talking about the two Republicans running, he talked about how the election was rigged and stolen in 2020 and how people shouldn't even go out to the polls because it was rigged. Right. That was, yes, it, fundamentally what he, what he was saying. And, and his most loyal fans sat home Two progressive Democrats in Georgia, right? In Georgia, progressive Democrats win. And that's why Judge Jackson was able to be both nominated and confirmed. Who are you going to blame for that? You're going to blame Joe Biden for picking somebody he wants? No, you blame Donald Trump for, for losing the Senate after he lost the House and the White House, by the way. Right. Indeed. So that's, that's the, I mean, this is the type of, you know, honest commentary um, and, you know, commentary with integrity that you're going to get at that you've always gotten, by the way, with with Bernie Goldberg, Bernard Goldberg dot dot com is where you find all of this. You should subscribe. I mean, the 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 subscription cost is minimal here. You should be subscribing to this anyway. The first episode of the No BS Zone is actually in the clear. You can go and go over there right now. Bernard Goldberg dot dot com and you can click over to it and and uh, watch the uh, watch the interview and and enjoy it and then sign up for it um, because uh, it's worth it. And if you, again, 
you know, Bernie's written a lot of really great books, but you got to start with bias because that is sort of like the urtext for media criticism in um, in the I, I don't know what you call this the 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 digital age. I guess we can call it now, and um, and certainly was inspiration to many many people, myself included. And uh, Bernie, yeah, I'm going to think. Wrote, and you wrote an update. I in, did in paperback edition. Can I make one point about the difference yeah. between? I wrote bias, call it 20 years ago to use round numbers. And I and my main point, one of my main points was that my conservative friends, there are no conspiracies. Dan Rather, <laughs> Dan Rather never summoned his top lieutenants into a dark room, pull the shades, douse the lights, and said, how are we going to screw those Republicans today? It didn't happen that way. There was no conspiracy. It was the result of a bunch of liberals getting together and bias resulted, okay? Yep. It's not true anymore. Now there is a conspiracy. Now people do come into the office in the morning and say, if they're liberals, how are we gonna screw those Republicans today? And and on the tiny fraction of mainstream media like Fox, that's conservative, they come in and they say, <laughs> let's look for it. Joe Biden stuttered yesterday, so let's do 10 minutes on that, you know? Uh, but the, the big difference, Ed, is that there was no conspiracy back then. It was just the product of groupthink. You put too many liberals in the newsroom, you're going to get liberal bias. Right. Now they do consciously say, how are we going to get the other side? Because that's the business model. That's how we keep yeah. our people happy. You know, Bernie, I'm not even sure you can call it conspiracy. I think it's really just a business model. I don't even, I mean, conspiracy to me sort of says, oh, this is a secret. I don't, I'm not even sure it's, it's a secret any longer. Anymore. You're right. Yeah, good point. Good point. So, well, you can find out more good points at bernardgoldberg.substack.com. Are you on Twitter anymore, Bernie? Yes, technically, but I'm not one of those guys who goes on Twitter and says, you know, I had pizza today and it was really good. I, no, I can't. <laughs> Shoot me if I ever if I ever do that and you don't shoot me, I will shoot you. But I, I did tweet during the 2020 election and I said, and this got like a lot of reaction. I heard from people I went to school with along, you know, who I haven't heard from in years. I said, Donald Trump is a detestable human being, and I hope he wins in a landslide. And and what I meant by the detestable part, he, he's just too dishonest for my taste. He right. Just, but I hope I wanted, I sat out the presidential election. I, I sat it out, okay? But I wanted him to win because I wanted his team to win, meaning the Republican Party to win. Right. Uh, but uh, aside from an occasional witty comment like, like that, <laughs> Uh, I'm not on Twitter on a regular basis. That just means every, that, every now and then, every now and then, but only every now and then. Well, that just means, Bernie, that they got to go over to Substack, to your Substack account, to get to get all of your uh, intellect and wit there, and that's where they should go. So again, I'll just promote it one more time: BernardGoldberg.substack.com is where you want to go for that. And congratulations on the launch of the new uh, No BS Zone series. And I can't wait to watch this one. I haven't watched the first one yet, but I can't wait to watch the rest of them either. Good. Thank you, Ed. And it's a pleasure seeing you again. I'm actually, not seeing you again, but talking to you again, because I, we've never actually seen each other up close and in personal. But uh, but this is this is a pleasure for me, and and thanks for inviting me on. Well, it's a pleasure for me too, sir. And uh, again. Hopefully we get a chance to uh, meet in person at some point and, um, and, and have a few more laughs. But thank you so much for coming on my podcast uh, to talk about these issues today, Bernie. I'd be glad to do it again if you ever want me on. I would. You will be hearing from me again. And uh, so that's a promise to uh, viewers. We'll get him back on again. Stay tuned for more from The Ed Morrissey Show. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. Joining us as always on Tuesdays, the Prince of T Twitter, the Regent of Red State, and now the Baron of Bunnies. <laughs> 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 the Baron of Bunnies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're pretty funny, Ed. You're really pretty good. 
Well, I mean, this was a great story. You, I mean, this is a great story. It's a great story about cultural clashes and uh, the blinders that we have on on, oh, I know. on our own it's culture, a, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you grow up and you hear about all oh, the Asian New Year and the Year of the Fox and the Ox and the, and the dog. I don't know what that. They have all these years of the snake and it's a bad year to be born and all that stuff. And they go, oh, that's so quaint. And then I was in Vietnam at the end, and then I was in uh, Guam, where 120,000 South Vietnamese joined me, <laughs> yeah. and and uh, among the group was about 25 uh, family members and our two interpreters from the Saigon Bureau, who uh, uh, had taken care of me in South Vietnam, so I felt I needed to reciprocate. And I bought them clothes, you know, they only got one suitcase apiece. And I bought them, have you ever tried to buy uh, bras for Asian women that you've never met, Ed? Uh, no, I, uh, I, I, I think I can, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that I've bought bras for any women, let alone women I haven't met, let alone of any extraction, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I, it, was, it was a bizarre experience. But one day around Easter in 1975, I was with them, just checking on them, and they were living in a military barracks. And uh, they had a radio. They weren't allowed to leave, but they had a radio, and they heard about this Easter business. Now, they were mostly Buddhist, and um, so they were aware, I think, of Easter, but um, they heard this stuff about an Easter bunny. And, um, you know, they were, they were, very earnest in wanting to learn about the new country that they were going to. None of them had ever been outside South Vietnam, <clears throat> ever. So suddenly they're plunked down in this island in the Pacific, and uh, they hear about this Easter Bunny, so they were inquiring about that. And so naively and innocently, I walked, oh, well, I can tell you about the Easter Bunny. But as I explained it, you begin to realize that it's even more bizarre than the traditions we hear about other <laughs> other cultures. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so they they said, well, what, what about the Easter Bunny? And I said, well, I won't I won't go into the whole thing, but because I want people to read the column. But right. Uh, you now it started off. They said, well, what what about the Easter Bunny? And I said, well, at Easter time, the parents go out and they buy two or three dozen eggs and he said um what's a dozen i said well that's 12 in american measure so that's about 36 eggs and uh and then they sit down with the children or they hard boil them and then they sit down with the children and they color them oh and oh, i'm sorry i blew it they said well what kind of eggs snake eggs or bird eggs <laughs> i said well no no they're chicken eggs uh, I'm sorry, chicken eggs. Well, everybody, now I had a translator translating this. Right. So the reactions in the crowd were delayed. So he said, no, no, they're chicken eggs. So everybody in the squatting on the floor, they all, yeah, okay. We got that chickens, we know. Uh, and I said, so they hard boil them and then they color them. And he said, why? <laughs> <laughs> and it's a I good said, question. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's spring colors. It's just a tradition. So I explained that to the people and they thought, oh, that that's a little strange, but we want to be polite here. Uh, and he said, so, so what, what do they, uh, what do they do with them? I said, well, that night after the children go to bed, the parents and grandparents hide all the hard boiled colored chicken eggs all around the house and the yard. <laughs> Dead silence. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is a, I mean, this is getting stranger. I, I've done this all my life, and it's, it's getting stranger by the moment, right? <laughs> and I said, yeah, and, and I would, I, of course, by then I realized, oh, my God, I'm in this quicksand. I, there's no way to get out. So I just played it. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, uh, and he checked with me and then he told the crowd they hide the chicken egg, the colored chicken eggs all over the house <laughs> silence <laughs> and he said well then 
then what? And I said, well, then in the morning, the parents tell the children that a large rabbit broke into the house during the night <laughs> and, and hid all these chicken eggs all over the house in the yard. <laughs> and there's dead silence. And he said, a large rabbit? I said, yeah, that's, that's the Easter Bunny. And he, he paused and he turned to the crowd and he told them in Vietnamese that a large rabbit broke into the house and hit all the colored chicken eggs around the house. And, and the crowd, their faces blanched. It's like, what the hell have we got ourselves into? And, and I goes, by then I was just playing it. And he said, he said uh, really? That, that's what they say? And I said, yeah. And the hand went up in the back as a grandfather. And he called on him. And the question was, uh, exactly how big are rabbits in America? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, well, they're big enough to hide three dozen chicken eggs colored all over the house. <laughs> and and that didn't that didn't help anything because I was trying to make a joke, but I was the only one laughing. <laughs> so so I said, no, no, it's a made up story. It's a made up story. They just they just say that. And he said, why? And I said, <laughs> you got me. When you find when you get there and and you find out, you, you give me a call and tell me why. I don't know, but it's what it's what we do. And and you know it it opened my eyes to all the the now i had lived this overseas and and um and i would live overseas some more years and and i i found it fascinating the different customs you know new year's yeah. new year's in japan you everybody goes home and they visit the graves and the relatives and and the temples the buddhist temples they have big logs and they bang them against the uh, huge bells uh, 108 times. And that's 108 sins. And I, I never got the list, but uh, there were 108 sins. Uh, then they banged them. It's beautiful to hear the bonging going on all over the city. Sure. And I use that as, you know, windows into the culture. And then, <laughs> then I realized, I started, so Ed, I want to assure everybody listening in case they realized how bizarre we are that I did not talk about uh, dressing up and uh, threatening people's houses with tricks if they don't give us candy. <laughs> and, and I didn't get into the fat guy who flies around with magic reindeer well, and, and breaks into the house again. Another guy breaking into the house. I, I guess that's a good thing because, you know, after all, <laughs> after all, these people were already refugees and they were already traumatized. And, oh, and here I you know, are. Know. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what went through their head? But I later, because I, I was so intrigued by that, when I was living in Japan, I did a story. I went to a preschool with an interpreter and we uh, it was a little chaotic, but we had a whole bunch of preschoolers and I interviewed them about Christmas and this, this guy, Santa Claus. And everybody knew about Santa Claus, but they thought he lived in Thailand. And, uh, and uh, I said, well, does he, you know, make the toys and have helpers and stuff? No, no, they don't do that. He goes to the department store and buys fancy toys. I said, okay. And uh, uh, what does he do? Well, it, there's no coming down the chimney. They don't have chimneys. Uh, so uh, this little girl said, well, he slides the door open and he comes in and he prays at my bed that I will grow up to be a beautiful woman. I said, oh, that's sweet. That's very nice. So I said, uh, I think it's coming up. Uh, when is uh, when is Christmas? And um, uh, everybody said, well, it was just before New Year's. And if one little girl raised her hand and said, um, it's the last Sunday in December. And this year it falls on the 25th. And I talked to her later and I found out she was the only Christian in the crowd. And oh, wow. so her, okay. and so her, the parents, because he had to work, the parents told her that it was the last Sunday in December. And that year it actually happened to be the 25th. No, I, I mean, you know, it's just, I love that stuff. It's great. That. It's great. But Andrew, I, I have to, uh, it, by the way, this is 
Andrew's column at redstate.com. So you should go read this. This is his latest column at redstate.com. But Andrew, I have to tell you, I have to contradict you here. I, I, I hate oh. to do this, but I have to fact check you. Yeah. You okay. mentioned you mentioned in your story that the that the giant rabbit uh, <laughs> is 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 a is is a is a is a myth. But that's uh -huh. not true. I actually have footage of the giant rabbit and and uh -oh. and it made an appearance today andrew and really it did in fact it was at the white house and let me show i'm going to see if i can't set this up so you see this as well as okay. everybody well, else show us show yeah. us it. i gotta i gotta show you this because uh this is i think the uh, uh let's see i don't think it's going to show it on the screen unfortunately oh it yeah showed... i see it well, unfortunately, you're seeing it, but the uh, but the viewers are not. So I have to I have to bail out back into that. Just trust me on this. I'm going to play this for I'm going to play this for the viewers, and uh, you're just going to have to trust me that this is uh, that that you're seeing the uh, you're seeing this. Now I'm going to uh, I I don't believe that the audio is going to play through on this, but just in case it doesn't, there's no there's no real there's just crowd noise on this. Here's Joe Biden at today's. Uh, at today's uh, egg roll, or it's not it's an egg roll. It's a you know the White House egg hunt. <laughs> egg hunt. Yeah, it is a roll. Okay, egg roll. Egg roll. Okay, at the White House egg roll. And this was Joe Biden trying to talk to reporters, and being interrupted by a giant mythological rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to see this again. He's over there, and I mean, literally, the rabbit is waving its paws in front of Joe Biden's face. All right, I'm going to I'm going to stop the audio on that. Um, I mean, this is this is um, I mean, this actually happened today. This is I mean, this is uh, Joe Biden. Yeah. There's a different angle where you can hear Joe Biden starting to talk about Afghanistan right now the the bunny in the the person who is in the bunny suit has been reported to be somebody on the white house communications team um i don't have her name in front of me but i could find it if i if i need to she's not the comms director but she's somebody on the team and the bunny goes over and stops the president of the united states from speaking to reporters by literally blocking his view of them and telling him Priceless. to go someplace else andrew what Priceless. the hell? <laughs> Priceless. Priceless. Well, you know, the, he's never identified who the they is that tells him you have to <laughs> call on these people for for uh, for questions or the people that they say I shouldn't answer questions. But um, so maybe it's a bunny. Who knows? It it's, could it's, be a rabbit. It's Harvey. It's Harvey the giant rabbit that tells Bro him. Who or he Harriet, can speak to? Harriet, Harriet. If it's a girl. I, I, I guess it would be Harriet. Yeah, Harriet would be uh, would be would be a, a better choice if it's a girl rabbit. And yeah. that's priceless. That is price. Did you guys do a post? Uh, Ala Pundit has a post coming up uh, on oh, this. Okay. Uh, so I by the time be... this goes up in the podcast, it will Ala Pundit's post will already have been up oh, there. I, okay. Well, but, I gotta I gotta see that. I mean, the R, That's a clip from the RNC. There's other clips showing the other angles and everything. I mean, this is. When you first see it, you're wondering if the, maybe the rabbit just wandered over there from the from the first angle, which is sort of the head-on angle for for Biden. But this clip that the RNC is floating around right now, I mean, this is clearly the rabbit is intervening and in stopping Joe Biden from from talking to it's the press. Amazing, just amazing. And what is anybody doing? You know, I mean, we're laughing, but this is the guy with the access to the nuclear launch codes, and He's unaware, and there's a bunny, a bunny telling the president what to do. I mean, honestly, have you ever seen no. this no. In, a, in a presidency before? I mean, there's no. always been presidents who, you know, you have a comms director, you have a press secretary to tell the press, okay, president's not taking any questions, you know, or yeah, the yeah, press, yeah, or yeah, press but, conference is over. But a rabbit, a rabbit took it upon herself to... Uh, to interrupt I, the president. I mean, I that's, mean, that's amazing. I've never seen an aide, even one that's not dressed up in a rabbit outfit, jump in front of a president to stop him from talking to reporters. It's yeah. It's it's disturbing. It really is. I mean, I know we're laughing about it because it because no, just I know it is disturbing. It is but it's disturbing, disturbing. <clears throat> for the country. Yeah. Well, you know, he's done he's done some stuff that is uh, security risks. He talked about the soldiers being in. Uh, 
when he visited them in Poland about being them being in Ukraine. Yep. And and then they had to correct and say, uh, no, they're not going. But he may have confused it with uh, the fact that we do have uh, some troops there, uh, perhaps clandestinely. They're studying the Russian st strategies and tactics and and whatever, which is great. I think they should. Right. But uh, I mean, this is this. I this mean, there, is, this is bizarre. I mean, this there was this. Important. There was this scene. I think it was from a couple of days ago where he was on the dais and he was delivering some remarks. Oh, and he turned yes. around, his hands stuck out, and there's nobody there, and he looked lost. Now, in that case too, I mean, you have to ask yourself, where's the White House staff there? That's one place where they should have had it set up for right. him. There was nobody else on the stage, and he turned and stuck his hand out. There's nobody there, and he looked around like, what the heck? Like he's and then he then he started to go in one direction and then another and then he stood still and he finally wandered off to the right. Uh, and then what was it? there was another one where he did oh when Obama visited the White House and everybody flocked around Obama and and Biden was kind of at the back of the crowd trying to get in and they didn't let him in. Yeah, this is one after another too. I mean these yeah. are oh, yeah. incidents one after another which really don't depict Joe Biden as being competent well what i would say is it depicts his the people around him as assuming he's not competent right yeah yeah i mean i mean yes uh, that's a good point yeah so i mean if if you have the the easter bunny tasked to you know for for you know guard that, the president yeah, of the united yeah, states yeah for for body blocking the the, the president <laughs> of the united states so he doesn't have access to reporters I mean, that's an indication that there is a fundamental lack of confidence in his abilities to do the job by his own Absol staff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, imagine if someone had tried to do that to Trump. <laughs> or, or even <laughs> Obama, right? Can you imagine yeah. if the Easter Bunny had tried to jump in front of Obama like that? <laughs> now, there was, there was a time where he was on the balcony and the Easter Bunny was next to him. And I don't know who it was, but he didn't. He didn't do anything. And then, as I recall, Sean Spicer was inside the bunny suit one year with Trump. Uh, would have been early on. I mean, he didn't he didn't do anything, but he's just uh, just decoration there. Um, and it's just such a contrast with the previous yeah. president. Yeah. Well, I, every with every other president, I I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that to a to a, a president before i mean i don't think people would do that to jimmy carter right jimmy carter is 90 something years old he's you know 40 years 42 years gone from the presidency if jimmy carter was over there and speaking to reporters do you think the easter bunny would have jumped in front of jimmy carter no 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 of course not uh and and biden's reaction when the bunny did that was just to walk away uh, yeah yeah, I mean, I, you didn't see it, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll shoot you over the clip. He 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 actually, the bunny pointed him off to the side, and he walked off to the side. Um, Jeez. it's yeah, it's. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to. I do. belabor this, Jeez. but <laughs> Andrew does. Yeah, I mean, it's it's insane. It's absolutely insane. It's shocking. It really is. Yeah. Oh. All right, well. so. Uh, uh, as, as a former boss of mine would say, uh, when he wanted something leaked, he said, here, see that you suppress this widely. Yes, and I think it is going to be suppressed widely by the RNC. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think that this it raises questions about the competency of the person who's in the White House. And unfortunately, the alternative <laughs> is um, Kamala great, Harris. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if you saw the political art article this morning about the, the, the hot new White House strategy of sending her to places like Greenville, Mississippi and uh, and and rural towns to to go on fact finding tours. And they were talking about how well, this is such a great opportunity for Kamala Harris to, yeah. you know, to yeah. absorb this and to inform policymaking. And I'm thinking it's possible. Right. Because I wrote a book about how both parties really should be doing more of that. Right. Going out. Yeah. Not. Not, not to their. What's power the uh, title of that, Ed? Um, I think it was called "Going Red." Actually, going and, red. And you yeah. should read it. Actually, yeah, I might have a, a copy or two behind me up on the shelf, Andrew. But um, so I don't want to discount that strategy as a good strategy. But I think it's 
equally likely, if not much more likely, that this is just a really great strategy to keep Kamala Harris away from the media. They're yeah. sending it to places that the media isn't going to cover. Now, um, the local media does, but their volume of coverage right. is, much, is much softer and quieter and more friendly because they're often in awe. Now, uh, I, Greenville, I believe, was the trip that she was on where she did another word salad. And they asked her why she was in Greenville. And I guess she really didn't know. But she said that Greenville was a very important town uh, in a very important state. Uh, and a part of the economy that they were working to improve. Yep. Well, yeah. well, that's good to know. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, it, Obama did this, by the way, in, in 2012, and he was very effective at it. He would go to these, he would go to smaller communities and get on local TV. And the reason why it was very effective, in fact, the White House press corps was so angry over this that they threatened to revolt and, August of 2012, Jake Tapper was one of the guys who led that. Um, and um, they ended up doing a little bit more national media after that because, because of course, it became the general election period too. But um, people may not recall this, but... Well, no, it's it's very, actually, it's very effective. And I, yeah. over, and I organized and oversaw Laura Bush doing that. We did... Um, like we would get her for an hour or two one day and we had, we had a little TV studio in Austin in the campaign headquarters. This is uh, 1999 and, um, and she would sit there and we would have a placard and she would get um, the local TV in Charlotte and then Milwaukee and all the other places. They would take the satellite feed and they would get uh, four or five minutes with uh, the future first lady of the United States. And uh, we had a little card that we held up underneath the camera with the names of who she was talking with, because she's going to talk with 15 or 20 people. Oh, yeah, so yeah. So, yeah. So she could say, well, Barbara, that's an interesting question. And then the next one is, Lewis, you know, I've got an answer for that or yep. whatever. Uh, and and they do that, and they can cover a lot of miles without leaving the room. And and you're right; it's very effective because a president or a first lady is bigger news locally than it is nationally. Uh, right, and, and they are the news locally. Whereas yeah, yeah. whereas in a national interview, the issues are going to be the news. Exactly, but, exactly. Right. And so and so if if if. Uh, if Joe Biden is talking to a TV station in Cheyenne, which he wouldn't talk in Cheyenne, but uh, in Texas somewhere, um, then uh, they get the exposure. It's a big deal, and they will play it for days. The President of the United States, and the quest, the the questions then are they're not designed to be easy, but they are easy. Right. How's well, the camp How's the campaign going? Exactly. Um, I, I don't want to knock no, the local news because local news is good at local news. But when you have a celebrity come into the studio, either figure, either literally or, or you know, virtually, um, it's the celebrity that they know what their audience wants. Their audience isn't looking for, you know, hard hitting questions. They're they're looking for ways to tie, you know, the the celebrity into 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 the local scene, right? right um, exactly right. Right, and, and again. Not a knock on local news. They have a job to do, um, and they usually do good good work on on local issues. On national issues, though, it's a little bit um, it gets overwhelmed by the celebrity, which is the reason why politicians like to do it. Now, now there the was thing one is that, time, yeah, there was one time where they made a little bit of national news. There was a an uppity uh, New Hampshire reporter who asked George Bush, George W. Bush. Uh, if he could name the president of Pakistan, oh, yeah. and and he couldn't, and then that led to a, a, a national debate where they asked Hillary Clinton who was president of of Russia, and of course it was uh, Medvedev at the time, but she didn't know. So yeah, you got to be careful on that. Yep, yep. Um, last topic I think before we get to the real. Uh, the real um, the, the segment of the show, the yeah. guts of the show. Um, Elon Musk is looking to buy Twitter outright, looking to do a, um, a, a private uh, you know, a privatization 
uh, 100% ownership. And let me tell you something. Um, apparently, billionaire ownership of of <laughs> media yeah. communications uh, platforms is the is is a complete existential threat to. Um, yeah. To democracy, say the say people who write at the Washington Post, the New York Times, <laughs> you know, the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff an, Bezos, a, 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 a billionaire, yeah, I, and I, the New York Times, which had uh, what's his name, Carlos Slim, was the bailed out uh, by a billionaire. Yeah, they yeah. were bailed out financially. Um, you've got uh, you've got. I mean, Warren Buffett owns. Dozens of newspapers, local right, newspapers. That's right. That's um, right. And he was selling some uh, recently. He, he was yeah. selling some recently. Yeah. So he was in the news with that. I, I mean, the idea that that somehow this is, I, I, you had one, I think it was New York Times um, uh, columnist, you know, saying this harkens back to the days of William Randolph Hearst and Citizen Kane. Uh, and yeah, it's yeah. like, <laughs> we never left those days, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in exactly. the Twin Cities when Glenn Taylor uh, bought up the Star Tribune. And I'm not even sure he still owns it, but I, I mean, he bought it up. And I remember it was a nine day wonder when people thought, well, you know, Taylor is a, a little bit more conservative than uh, traditional media in the Twin Cities, which is not difficult to do. But <laughs> I mean, you could be you could be Bernie Sanders and be slightly more conservative than traditional media in the Twin Cities. Uh, and then when when he said, I'm I'm really just interested in it as, as a um as an investment, I'm not planning to be involved in editorial policy. Everybody said, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you, yeah. You're our kind okay. of billionaire. Yeah. yeah, our kind. Well, yeah, and the, uh, the LA Times is owned by uh, yeah, by a Patrick Yeah, uh, Patrick Soon Xiong, I think is his name. Yeah, it's owned by a billionaire. Yeah. 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 As well as the San Diego, uh, um, is it Union Tribune? Yeah. 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 And um, the same billionaire, Patrick... Uh, yeah, uh, Shun Xiang uh, bought both of them and a couple other things, a couple other lesser uh, uh, outlets as well. But I mean, this is it's really been instructive, I think, Andrew, to see the media freak out over the idea that um, yeah. Elon Musk might just allow people to say what they think on <laughs> on a social media platform. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, I know. What a shock that they that that he would do such a thing, such a tawdry thing. It would be disorderly, Ed. Yeah, I, I guess it's the end of democracy as we know it. Free speech is the end of democracy as we know it. The well, saving grace of democracy is apparently top-down censorship by current billionaire owners rather than well, you new know, billionaire owners. Dem democracy, democracy dies uh, in uh, billionaire ownership. Yeah, apparently. In the darkness of in the darkness of free speech, democracy dies in the in the, in the darkness of of free yeah. speech. Yeah, what, uh, a yeah. what, what a threat! What a threat! What a threat! All right. With that said, let's get to the real meat and potatoes of the okay. Ed Morrissey Show. So uh, we have uh, these are all old ones, but the David Letterman replay says New York City, like the whole country, is in such bad financial shape. Um, uh, it laid off the pest control workers. Now I know what you're saying. New York City has pest control workers. <laughs> uh, and um, the, the, the Fallon replay he says NASA predicts astronauts will reach Mars by 2030. Many apparently want to go when NASA asks if they're ready for a lonely life where they can only communicate and relate to people through a screen. They looked up from their cell sorry what <laughs> uh, um, and uh, finally um, another fallon he says a new survey finds that 55 percent of men expect to pay on the first date while the other 45 percent have never been on a second date <laughs> I thought the, I thought the other forty five percent were just going to expect to pay for the rest of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Of course, exactly. not 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 Andrew or I, because you know our spouses oh, are, yes, are absolute. Absolutely. Well, they have to be absolute absolute, absolute saints <laughs> saints to put up with us. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. But uh, and our and our Waldorf and Statler uh, antics on an ongoing basis. And yeah, and by the yeah. way. Uh, Ed Morrissey show viewers 
clearly are also saints for for this. Oh, but... absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I know it's the wives that roll their eyes, but it just makes sure they yeah. won't hear it. They won't. They won't hear this one. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. We're going to cut this off. We're, I think we're going to edit this one out of. No, I'm just kidding. Andrew Malcolm. We never edit a Andrew Malcolm because no, he's... because so uh, Elon Musk might buy you. <laughs> and, and what a threat that would be. I, you know, if I would be willing to sell the Ed Morrissey Show podcast to Elon Musk. Really? I I, I would, would be. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You know. Well, don't say the price, Ed, because you don't want to put a, a ceiling on it. The, the first person to name the price loses. I've I've learned that much by watching <laughs> um, Wolf of Wall Street, and that's and that's all I've learned from the Wolf of Wall Street. First person to talk loses. Um. So, but Elon, if you happen to be watching, you know, make me an offer. I. Yeah, you know, it's make, a, make it's me a, an offer that I would never refuse. Yeah, this is a, this is an economic powerhouse. You'll definitely want to you'll definitely want to spend a lot of money buying buying me out of this uh, <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, Andrew Malcolm, uh, we're we're never going to want to buy Andrew Malcolm out of this no, podcast because he no, is the prince no. of Twitter. I'm, I'm open to some price. <laughs> well, there you right go. Right. Yeah. Hey. You know, uh, we may we may not be cheap, but we can be bought. I'll just put it that That's way. Right. That's right. <laughs> and I'm a I'm a big user of Kleenex brand tissues. <laughs> I yeah. almost want to pull out my my sugar free peeps. I mean, I actually there got some go. sugar free peeps this year. So yeah, this yeah. Uh, well, uh, next show we do, you're standing next to your Solar Grill. Oh, that's a great idea. My Solar Grill. Yeah, yeah. I am I am cheap, but I am I'm I, I'm I'm not cheap, but I am easy. I'll just put it that way. I'm not cheap, <laughs> but I'm easy. All right. Andrew Malcolm, region of redstate.com, Prince of Twitter at AH Malcolm. Thanks as always for being here with us on Tuesdays. You bet. Thanks, Ed. Thanks everybody. See you next week. <laughs> Stay tuned for more from the Ed Morrissey Show. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast, and I am very pleased to introduce to you Rebecca Koffler, who is the author of Putin's Playbook, a book which came out last year, which presaged everything that's been going on this year, as well as the author of a foreword to a new book, Zelensky, the Unlikely Ukrainian Hero Who Defied Putin and United the World. Uh, Rebecca, thanks for joining me today. Of course, Ed. Such a pleasure to be here with you and your audience. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I, we'll start off, I think, with the Zelensky book. This is, it's just coming out, and it's actually a, um, a collection, I believe, or it's a, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort attempting to tell the story of, uh, it's a biography, basically, of Zelen uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, and, um, and, and this particular moment in time in Ukraine. And... Um, the um, and I think you, you were one of the authors as well as the um, as well as the um, uh, author of the foreword. Uh, tell us a little bit about Zelensky. Uh, he kind of came out of nowhere in in the previous election. He's a former actor um, who has become one of the most serious leaders in the world in a very short span of time. Yes, absolutely. He, that's the title of the book, actually, The Unlikely Hero Who Defied Putin and United um, the World. So Zelensky, like you said, came out of nowhere. And in fact, um, there, there was a special done by uh, Fox Nation, and they reached out to me to uh, figure out who is the expert on Zelensky. And we were really, you know, they were struggling to find somebody because nobody really knew anything about him. And, uh, and I said, well, guess what? You know, Regnery actually put out a book. Uh, like you said, uh, Zelensky uh, is formerly an actor. He was born to a Jewish family in 1978. Um, his parents were uh, somewhat of intellectuals, and he originally went to um, study to become an attorney. But he was absolutely not interested in uh, law. He had a streak of a performer, and he really wanted to be an actor. And he had quite a successful career uh, being an actor and a performer and this type of skill 
you know, his sense of drama, his ability to invoke emotions has served him very well in his presidency and defined his role as a wartime president in this, you know, conflict, Russia's war on Ukraine. You know, Rebecca, I think it strikes me that this is maybe one of the oddest preparations for somebody who ends up being such a stalwart uh, wartime leader. Um, I, I would, I, the first thing that, I, that comes to mind for me, of course, is Ronald Reagan, who was president when I was a young man, who had been an actor for a very long time. But Ronald Reagan actually had a pretty long ramp up to his political career. He had been mm -hmm. governor in California for two terms. Prior to that, he'd done a, a 10 years uh, doing you know, but what they used to call the dinner circuit, doing lectures on politics and on policy and on philosophy, governing philosophy. So he had spent a lot of time transitioning into that career, whereas Zelensky uh, really didn't have as at least as much time uh, working in politics and working to uh, build coalitions. And I think that it's clearly part of his innate um, character. The, uh, that he is, uh, first off, a patriot, and secondly, somebody who is willing to uh, put himself at risk to rally uh, people to his banner. This is something that you don't normally see from politicians. And um, and I think that a lot of people underestimate him. Of course, you know, the West tried to, uh, wanted to evacuate him and, and start a government in exile. And he said, I, I need guns, not not." Uh, airplane tickets. I mean, what hints do we have in his background that he was going to have that sort of steel in the spine? Absolutely. Zelensky actually puts our politicians to shame with his uh, will to fight, with his drive and his passion for his native country, Ukraine. Um, interestingly, you, uh, Zelensky was born speaking Russian and he learned Ukrainian as a second language. And now he only speaks Ukrainian, obviously as the head of state, unless he needs to address the Russian people, which is also part of his mission. As you know, the Russians have been conducting just brutal, brutal campaign, you know, targeting civilians. And uh, Zelensky has been using his uh, skills in order to garner support from the Western leaders to help him fight against, you know, uh, the brutal invasion of the Russian leader. So he, it, it appears as though, like you said, he has a very innate drive. He has a streak of a uh, freedom fighter. And in fact, he deems himself right now as the world's freedom fighter. Uh, my intelligence indicates that he has ambitions that go beyond uh, just simply being the president of Ukraine, a country that nobody really knew until, well, not nobody, but many people didn't know until February 24th when uh, Russian President Putin unleashed what he calls a uh, special military operation to uh, quote unquote, demilitarize and denazify uh, Ukraine, which is a line, it's, it's a disinformation campaign. But believe it or not, Zelensky actually has absolutely upstaged uh, Putin in the information warfare department. The way that Zelensky came to become president is uh, after he played one on TV, if you will, in a show called The Servant <coughs> of the People, he embarked on a very robust social media campaign uh, using Facebook and uh, other social media platforms to promote his views. And he continues to use social media and videos in which he uh, portrays himself as this, you know, wartime leader. He's wearing fatigues very often. He speaks to multiple parliaments, right? He spoke to Congress. He made interpreters cry, you know, with his uh, 
appeals with his stories of the Russians, you know, killing women, children. Um, he assembles videos that are so hard to watch. It, he basically has touched hearts and minds of population all, all over the world. And this is why we see the world effectively uniting to help Zelensky. And this is a tremendous blow to Putin because Putin has always viewed himself as the one who has outmaneuvered, you know, multiple Western leaders, including our own President Joe Biden. And so we have the battle of the wills, if you will, right now, of, of the two Slavs, the two Slavic leaders. You know, on the one hand, we have a cold-blooded former KGB operatives, operative who sanctioned assassinations, poisonings, and then we have this actor, the performer, whom some people call Churchill in a t-shirt or even uh, Ukrainian Ronald Reagan. And so it's they shape these personalities um, have shaped this war tremendously. Indeed, indeed. And uh, we're going to get to Putin's playbook in, in just a second here, too. That's the book that you wrote last year, also from Regnery. Um, and by the way, uh, the, uh, Zelensky, the unlikely Ukrainian hero who defied Putin and united the world, will be available on April 19th, um, which is probably when this podcast will be uh, actually published. So likely it would be today. Um, but of course, it's been up for um, pre-order um, all along. And um, turning to Putin's playbook. Now, you wrote Putin's playbook yourself. And, and before we get to the actual book, tell us a little bit about yourself, Rebecca. Tell us a little bit, you know, what your background is so that we know what it is that you're bringing to um, Putin's playbook. Sure. I was born behind the Iron Curtain in the former Soviet Union, the countries that no longer exist. Uh, it was destroyed by socialism and total government control. I came to the United States in 1989. Uh, I was raised by parents who disagreed with the uh, Soviet socialist communist system. And they were raising me with the idea that I would eventually go to America. I don't know why, but they always told me that America is the land of freedom, justice, and opportunity. And that's the place to be. And they made sure that I learned English and went to, you know, university to learn some more English. So after September 11th, after I already was uh, living in the United States, uh, I decided in the aftermath month of the terrorist attacks on our country, I wanted to serve and uh, to give back this wonderful homeland uh, of mine, adopted homeland, which I love. And uh, I became an intelligence officer for DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is a military counterpart to CIA. And so I specialized in Russian doctrine and strategy as part of that. I uh, participated and led red teams in war games. I briefed NATO commanders. I briefed combatant commanders in, um, in our country. And uh, I briefed scores and scores of Pentagon's uh, officials, as well as national security uh, staff in the White House, Congress uh, staff, and this is what I bring to the table. This is why I wrote the book, because I wanted to warn uh, my fellow countrymen and women about the true threat presented by um, the Russian war machine and right. uh, specifically Russian President Putin. You know, it's interesting, too. Uh, because I don't think that there is, I, I don't think there should have been a lot of mystery as to the threat that Vladimir Putin represents. I think that those scales really should have fallen off the eyes of Western leaders after 2008's invasion of Georgia, for instance, or, you know, and, and then clearly in 2014, when Putin seized Crimea and, and, and he went after the Donbass, I mean, it was clear that this is the latest iteration of Russian imperialists. 
right? Uh, Russian, Russian expansionist, Russian imperialist. And I mean, all you had to do was listen to Putin talk, right? I mean, he, he made this clear back in 2005 and in 2007 in public statements about that, um, the historical mistake of allowing these republics to have their own sovereignty um, and Ukraine specifically. Um, why do you think that people took so long to figure out what Putin was? You know, it's a mystery to me, Ed. You're 100% correct. Putin never made his ambitions a secret. You know, uh, the Russians codified in their military doctrine back in 2010 that the US and NATO were uh, their primary security threat. And even before that, they invaded Georgia, as you pointed out. And every single strategic planning document, uh, such as military doctrine, national security strategy, foreign policy concept, every single speech and press conference that Putin gave, or, or Foreign Minister Lavrov, or Minister of Defense Shoigu, you name it, was unambiguous about what the plan was, uh, the intelligence record was very straightforward about what Putin's plan was. And yet uh, our entire national security apparatus was caught off guard. And it is a shame. I, I try to give the warning uh, when I was an intelligence officer. I ended up paying for that with my career, actually, because people just didn't want to hear. I briefed scores and scores of President Obama's Pentagon's officials. And uh, the response was, you know, the usual uh, oh, Russia is a gas station masquerading as a country. Its GDP is the size of Italy. And uh, oh, no, this would be completely crazy, but we're not going to go to war with Russia. So it, it, it seems like it's a malaise uh, of the Washington security apparatus to dismiss anything that doesn't fit into their mental framework. And so, uh, and not only that, anybody who challenges the group think and says, well, that's not how the Russians think, uh, they dismiss. And right. really, uh, the intelligence analysis, the accuracy of the intelligence analysis depends on plurality of opinion. And so you ask me, what is the reason? Here's the reason, Ed. One is there's a lot of incompetence going on in the intelligence community because very few people understand foreign cultures, whether it's Russia, China, you know, Afghanistan. Why are we in this mess, you know, all, all, all over the world? Because right. people who are not qualified for their jobs, who don't speak the Russian language or any or those other languages, never set the foot in that target country. They make analytic conclusions without having any kind of understanding how the adversary thinks. We're very good at tracking capabilities, okay? Military capabilities of these various foreign actors. But as an institution, we just simply cannot, you know, uh, make sensible conclusions about the motivations, the goals of foreign leaders and um, they don't think like us. Putin does not think like an American. Uh, Russians don't think like Americans. The Chinese, neither do the Chinese. And so the second reason is, is corruption uh, at the upper echelons of the intelligence community. And we've seen that, you know, in several uh, recent instances. Right. So, um, so that's a great background, first off. And I, I completely agree with you about our inability to... Um, our insularity, I would just say insularity, right? I, I think that um, to some extent, we don't want to believe it because we don't want to believe it because then it becomes, it becomes very inconvenient to realize that you've got somebody out there who is actually going to conduct this type of um, policy, this this sort of military aggression and, and conquest, because then it forces you into a whole lot of uncomfortable... <laughs> decisions. And I think that we've had several administrations in a row that really just didn't want to address that um, until now. Of course, now we're stuck with what we've got in Ukraine. Um, so again, getting back to Putin's playbook, and this is the book that you wrote last year. Mm -hmm. How did your book predict 
what Putin was going to do next. So I have a section, one of the chapters actually is called Putin's wish list, American's nightmare. And I had a section under it predicting instability areas. So the Russians uh, concluded several years ago that a war between the United States and Russia is inevitable. And this was uh, forecasted as a result of threat assessment that they do on a long-term basis. They assess 50 years out. We don't do anything like that. Uh, right. We can barely see beyond our nose. Um, and, uh, and so because Putin had these ambitions to reconstitute a, uh, a former Soviet Union-like alliance as a counterweight to uh, European Union uh, as a counterweight to NATO. He already stood up a counterweight uh, to NATO called the uh, CSTO, Collective Security right. Treaty Organization. And so the next step is the Eurasian Economic Union and uh, Russia and Belarus are already part of that. And in fact, they call themselves the Union. And the Russian intelligence services also watched and analyzed U.S. policy and U.S. military campaigns for the past 20 years. Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. And so they have concluded that we have certain vulnerabilities and they concluded that U.S. and NATO is the impediment to Putin's plan and his playbook. You know, I called the book the Putin's Playbook, Russia's Secret Plan to Defeat America. And basically what it is, it's a description of his plan that includes five major instruments, military, uh, and, which includes nuclear, and then a whole series of, of non-military instruments such as cyber attacks, espionage, space warfare, and something called active measures, which includes anything from intimidation and assassinations to election sabotage. And that's what I predicted. We pretty much have seen uh, most of these uh, instruments uh, being employed in this conflict with the exception of uh, nuclear warfare just yet, although it is my assessment that uh, Putin, if cornered like a rat, and he is pretty much feeling uh, cornered with, you know, all the activities that we are taking and all the rhetoric such as regime change and all that. So I do not rule out the possibility of him even using nuclear warfare. And he did employ chemical warfare already in an unorthodox or asymmetric way as the Russians call it by uh, striking chemical plants and uh, Sumi creating an ammonia yep. leak. So, and <clears throat> recently he appointed General Alexander Dvornikov who facilitated the use of chemical weapons in Syria on behalf of Bashar al-Assad. So my assessment is that this conflict is entering in the hottest phase um, in 50 days, almost 50 days that we've had. And Rebecca, as we're talking, and we're recording this on um, April 11th, uh, there's a report that uh, the Russians have deployed a chemical weapon in Mariupol by drone. So I don't know if that's, it's yet to be confirmed, but there are reports that, that they've already already done that. So I think that the new Russian commander is uh, already, um, is already uh, at work on that. The way that you describe this, though, reminds me of... Uh, the Russian, the, the Soviet era, the, the, especially the later Soviet area, you know, when um, when uh, Gorbachev came to power. And this was, of course, after you had this incredible churn in Soviet leadership. You know, you had, uh, in the West, we were joking around about, you know, a cold is, is never fatal unless you're in the Politburo. Um, but um, Gorbachev was part of the modernizers, the reformers who were going to try to actually hammer out peaceful coexistence rather than just, at least that was the idea. But even then there was this undercurrent. And I remember when you talk about this, I remember hearing about this in, in the 1980s about a faction within the Soviet um, Union, high up in the Soviet Union, military and political circles that saw, just as you said, 
uh, uh, that a war with the United States was inevitable, it would happen within the next 50 years. And so what I'm hearing you say, basically, is that Putin and his clique really are coming from that hard line, um, that hard line uh, thread, I guess you could mm -hmm. say, of, of Soviet uh, doctrine. Absolutely. Putin has made out of the same cloth as uh, and produced out of the same culture that produced Ivan the Terrible, who killed his own son, and Joseph Stalin, who murdered millions of the Russian people. So there is a long sort of uh, term thinking in the Russian uh, elite within the Russian elites in the uh, Soviet and Russian government apparatus that is actually fed by several um, doctrinal uh, types of thinkers such as Alexander Dugin, who envisions a long-term battle between Eurasianism and Atlanticism. And interestingly, uh, Rowan Zbigniew-Bzizinski wrote a book that's called The Global Chessboard, where he, one of the quotes is that that who controls Eurasia controls the world. Well, that philosophy also comes from a very long-term school of thought that originated from somebody named uh, Spikeman and Mackinder that uh, and, and that school of thought is that, yes, we need to control the Eurasian heartland because it's a strategic area. And so the Russians know that. They quote that statement uh, routinely. And they know that we have a bipartisan long-term policy that used to be highly classified, but uh, somehow it leaked and now it's in the open. Uh, it leaked, I believe, in, 20, in 2008. And the policy is that the United States will do everything possible to prevent the emergence of a hostile foreign power in Eurasia. Well, what's a hostile foreign power? It used to be USSR, and now it's Russia. Even though you know, during the or in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union back in 1991, everyone in the Western security um, domain expected the so-called peace dividend that right. never happened, and so that tradition that you're talking about of that thinking of uh, that there is a war eventually between US, NATO, and Russia. And so that is why Putin has uh, mobilized both the Russian economy and the entire Russian military back and before his invasion of Crimea in July 2013, he approved a top secret plan that pretty much I describe at the unclassified level, I describe uh, in my book. And so that's what we see unfolding today, right before our eyes. And I'm praying to God that not all the aspects of that plan are executed right, specifically, yes. yes, specifically nuclear warfare. And the Russians that have been signaling several Russian officials, you know, um, have already uh, stated that they have entered the total war phase in this conflict. And that is a very serious statement, coupled with the fact that they do not pick up calls from the Pentagon. And that means a lot in the Russian doctrine when there's no communication between the two countries. So Rebecca, we've got a couple minutes left and I, I, I want people, I don't want to give away all the secrets of the book. Um, so people should go buy Putin's playbook. They should also uh, buy Zelensky. Um, both of, you know, Zelensky will be on sale on April 19th. Uh, you can get Putin's playbook immediately and you should do that. But let me ask you this. I mean, the, the Russian military has turned out to be in, really incredibly incompetent in the field. I mean, Ukraine is certainly not a world beating military. And yet, of course, they're defending their homeland, which gives them some advantages. But I mean, this is the Russians backyard and they couldn't execute uh, well enough to take Kiev. 
um, or Kharkiv for that matter. Um, they've had to wheel around to, to maybe settle for Donbass and, and Mariupol. Uh, does, does the incompetence and, and, and poor uh, uh, material uh, from uh, the Russian uh, war so far in Ukraine, does that change calculations for Putin and the Kremlin? Do you think that that is going to put pressure on Putin uh, to to back off at some point and, and have a more realistic uh, assessment as to just how well they could function against a first rate military, not, not just a, not just a, a homeland defense force. I don't think it's going to uh, change Putin's decision calculus. Uh, yes, the Russians have surprised most Western intelligence uh, analysts with what you call tact incompetence. Uh, in my view, it is tactical incompetence, which is quite uh, typical for the Russians. Uh, so the Russians don't fight like Americans. Uh, right. It's apples and oranges to compare uh, the U.S. superior military capability and our war fighting style. We are excellent at command and control. We're excellent at precision targeting. Uh, we're excellent at minimizing casualties, especially obviously civilian casualties. We can put iron on target with the precision of a uh, surgeon, you know, brain surgeon doing. Um, surgery of the amygdala let's say i don't know if such thing um can be done right now i, I think it's a, it's a great analogy it's a great analogy though it, <laughs> so, it hits the, um, it really hits the target so to speak i'm just very proud of um of u.s military right because we are you know my former agency and i as a former dia officer that's what we do we support our war fight i give them everything that they need in terms of intelligence obviously now that's not the russians um they if you remember uh what happened back in 2008 during their campaign against georgia right they they they, they couldn't even strike you know mobile targets they they just don't have the same level of command and control so their typical war fighting style is brute force you know throwing just you know uh as many soldiers in the fight as fodder basically uh feeding them into the wood chipper and uh targeting civilians targeting civilians is part of russia's brutal war fighting style and the goal is to put pressure both on the population by committing atrocities and inflict the level of suffering uh, that is difficult to sustain and put pressure on the leader you know in this case Zelensky to abandon the fight okay right so yes tactically they have been um really really bad okay now Let's look at a uh, strategic side of things. What is Putin's original reason to uh, start the war on Ukraine? And, and it's not the democracy business. If you listen to Western press, you know, there's, there, there actually lies on both sides, right? Both sides sure. are waging dim disinformation. Putin talks about denazification. We talk about Putin being, you know, scared of democracy. Well, let me say this, uh, d uh, Ru neither Russia nor Ukraine are in any danger of uh, turning into democracies anytime soon. You know, Ukraine is one of the most corrupt uh, countries on earth, probably trailing only, uh, only Russia. And uh, the real reason is security concerns. Putin wants to enforce his version of the Monroe Doctrine because uh, the distance between NATO forces and St. Petersburg, the second largest city in Russia has reduced from the Cold War to today from 1,000 miles to 100 miles. No sane military uh, leader will tolerate this sort of proximity. So, his also Putin's red line, as he always said, is Ukraine's potential membership in NATO. He is achieving his goal right now. As long as there's an active conflict, either active combat actions or even frozen conflict, 
Ukraine cannot be part of NATO because one of the requirements for NATO is sovereignty and territorial integrity. Right. Zelensky has stated that he has his own red line. He's not giving back Crimea. So what does that mean? Crimea technically right now is part of in, in factually in Russia, even though we don't recognize it. So their positions are irreconcilable, which means that the conflict is going to turn into a protracted, grinding, long-term battle. And as long as that's happening, strategically, Putin has achieved his goal. And that's what he's after. What happens when Finland decides to join NATO? <laughs> I mean, they're 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 talking about this. I, 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 I hope you don't mind me keeping a couple minutes longer because I got to ask the question. What of happens course. when Finland and hey, Sweden is one thing. Sweden, it, it's, you know, Sweden's pretty close. But Finland, there's an 850 mile border. And you talk about being 100 miles from St. Petersburg. Well, that's, you know, that's Finland. But they're about 150 miles away from Murmansk at that point, too. And Murmansk mm -hmm. is a very important Russian naval base. Um, so what happens if Finland joins NATO at this point? I don't think there, there's much Putin can do about it if, if they want to do it. And that decision might come as early as next month. Yes, yes, there's a there's a, there's a plan for both uh, Finland and Sweden to become part of NATO this summer, and uh, it's a problem for Putin. Uh, he is, you know, threatening all kinds of uh, things, but in reality, he's not going to do anything militarily. This would be the next level of escalation that, at this time, uh, I assess, especially given the abysmal performance. Uh, tactically of the Russian forces. He's not going to mount any kind of uh, offensive. Now, that doesn't rule out any kind of destabilization operations uh, by the Russians, either through cyber or through active measures that I spoke assassinations, about. Assassinations, yeah, assassinations. Uh, maybe not exactly. Like, uh, they haven't really assassinated foreign leaders uh, at least recently. Uh, they have assassinated and poisoned um, Russian nationals or British nationals of Russian descent yeah. on foreign soil. They have intimidated and killed people, including on U.S. soil, but of their own um, nationality. So that part I don't rule out, and they routinely conduct interference operations in elections, and not just in America, but across Europe. So that I anticipate. But uh, no, they're not going to touch militarily Sweden or or Finland or the Baltics for that matter. I know the Baltics are concerned right now, but uh, he is not touching any NATO country. He fears NATO. He does have a plan if we intervene on behalf of Ukraine or any other post-Soviet state. Um, he does have a plan to escalate the conflict into the NATO uh, nuclear realm. There's a special doctrine that's developed called escalate to deescalate, but he's not going to uh, attack a NATO country out of the blue. Interesting. Well, I have kept you for far too long. You've been far too patient with me, uh, Rebecca Koffler, but um, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. And I'm very happy to promote both uh, the book Zelensky, which is out on April 19th, and Putin's Playbook, which you can get at any time. And you should over at Amazon.com. I'll have the uh, link in the uh, podcast launch post. Uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for your time. I hope that we can uh, maybe stay in touch and uh, you can give us some good analysis of how things are going as this conflict um, rolls on. I think we're going to be talking about this for a very long time. Of course, it's been such a delight uh, to have been with you and your audience. Uh, yes, uh, check out the books. They're both available, uh, one for pre-order, the other is uh, right now. And then I'd be delighted to join you again. Thank you very much, Rebecca Koffler. Stay tuned for more from The Ed Morrissey Show. We'll be right back.